How are we doing, everybody? And happy Tuesday in the great state of Wisconsin. Hopefully, we get a little bit of warmer weather today. Yesterday, blistering cold. It was absolutely terrible. The wind was guzzling. Oh, man, it was just a rough one yesterday. Today, the rest of this week looks like it's supposed to warm up. So we're hoping to see a little bit of warm weather before, you know, we're going to get pounded here pretty soon. We're going to get a little bit of snow. We're going to get a lot of cold. We're hoping for a little bit of warm weather yet this year. But with that, this is Wisconsin Sports on the go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. Today, Austin is with me. Austin, how was practice yesterday in that cold weather? It, it wasn't fun. I'm not going to lie. Um, let's see. I had two long sleeves and a sweatshirt on, and uh, hands were cold. My toe, my big toes were freezing. It wasn't fun, but it's worth it for what we're trying to get to. So definitely worth it. That was the worst part about playoff football. That's why... I, I I hated playoff football. I just hated playoff football in general. I love sitting in the stands. I could wear boots. I could wear my jacket, long johns, everything in between. I was all in. But being on the field, not my forte for that one there. I mean, we did suck, though. But anyways, <laughs> anyways, that's enough about that. We got to get in. You know, and they say before that, they do say once your feet get cold, you're done. They say once your feet are cold, you can't warm them babies back up. The piggies will not come back out of the barn when they are nope. froze. So, you know... You were screwed from the get-go. But with that, we got a lot we got to tap into today. We got the Bucks coming up tonight. They got the Heat. We got Badger basketball picking up a win yesterday against Western Illinois. Wasn't pretty, but a win's a win. Heading into that Marquette, the big, I mean, three-game uh, three game series that they're going to have here, matchups with Marquette, Michigan State, and Arizona coming up on the docket. So we're going to get over that game, look at it, see what we thought. Also looking at Badger football a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit more about that game uh, against Minnesota. Austin kind of got cut out the last time uh, when we were talking about that game against Minnesota. He got most of what he was trying to say, but we weren't able to discuss very far. So we're going to get into that matchup a little bit more. Also talk about the Badgers. They're awaiting a bowl game at this point. So we're going to kind of look at where they're predicted to go and see what we think. Also, checking out the college football weekend. We're going to look at the recap of this last rivalry weekend and see how the matchups fared and how we did in our picks. But with that, right away, we're going to jump into the Bucs. The Bucs take on the Heat tonight. That should be, I mean, they played early on this year, but I think this is going to be a huge matchup for the Bucs, especially the way they've been playing as of late. Bucs coming into this one 12-5. and five. The Heat coming in at 10-7. and seven. The Bucs 6.30 start that will be from uh, South Beach. So not a big help that they're playing on the road in this one either. Chris Middleton still a game time decision for this one. On the opposite side for the Heat, a lot of guys on the injury report right now. Duncan Robinson, Bam out of Bayou, Jimmy Butler, and Tyler Hero all on the injury report. Tyler Hero is out as of November 27th. And then looking at uh, Duncan Robinson out of Bayou and Butler, all game time decisions. So the Heat are kind of limping into this one. Losers of two straight leading up into this game against the Knicks and the Brooklyn Nets. Bucks, winners of two in a row. So Bucks a little bit more favorable. But with that, I'm going to jump over to Austin here with the stats for this one. Yeah, um, starting off with the Heat, I mean, they still got some pretty good players. Tyler Hero, Wisconsin native, we've talked about him a couple times. Um, he's averaging 22.9 points per game, leading the Heat. And then Bam out of bio, 22.7 points. Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Buckets, whatever you want to call him, he has 20.7 points. And then Duncan Robinson kind of rounded it off for them with 14.5 points per game. But um, looking at it here, it seems like Tyler Hero, Bam out of bio, and Jimmy Butler, kind of three-headed monster there for the Miami Heat. Bam, also, he's uh, averaging 10.4. Right now, he's averaging a double-double. Uh, he has 10.4 rebounds per game also, which um, could be a challenge for the Bucks. It also says uh, Kyler, Kyle Lowry is also on the Heat, and also Kevin Love. I did not know, I did not know that Kevin Love was with them, I guess. Um, I should have known that, but those two are on there too. Um, Kevin Love kind of out of his uh, out of his playing days now. He's he's a little bit older there. Same with Kyle Lowry's a little bit older, um, but those two guys are um, veterans there and uh, know how to play some ball. But from the looks of the stats wise, it looks like Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler, and then Bam Adebayo are going to be almost carrying um, the Heat in this one. 
It says Tyler Hero's only played eight games. I don't know if he's if he's in for this one or what's his status, but um, that's what just that's what the stat says on them. Yeah, with the Heat right now, Tyler Harrell is ruled out of Tuesday's game as of right now with an ankle injury is what it looks like. Oh, okay. I don't know if you just completely missed my injury report that I just gave earlier on, but whatever. It's fine. It's fine. We're one-sided conversations here on the show. <laughs> you're you're freezing okay. up and stuff. It's the Wi-Fi again. It's the Wi-Fi again. He's going to blame the Wi-Fi. But either way... Bucks, it's going to be heavily reliant on how does Giannis, how does Damian Lillard play in this one? Is Chris Middleton out there, and what do they get out of Brooke Lopez? That's going to be your big things for the Bucks in this one. Also, the Bucks defense. We got to see better play out of the Bucks defense, especially on the perimeter. We went over it a little bit yesterday of how how badly the Bucks are struggling uh, to defend the perimeter right now, and I think this is going to be a big test for them going up against the Heat, especially with Jimmy Butler. If Duncan Robinson plays in this one, you don't have to worry about Tyler Harrell, but they still have guys out there on the perimeter. Also, going to be a big game for Giannis and Brooke Lopez, especially with Bam out of Bayou down there in the post for this Heat team. So with that, 6.30 on TNT for this one. Should be a good matchup. A favorite, and, and, you know, honestly, should if those guys, if a majority of those guys in the injury report aren't playing, this should be a favorable matchup for the Bucs going down to South Beach. It's never easy to play in South Beach no matter what, but if injuries hold true, Chris Middleton comes back, I do think the Bucs should be favored in this matchup. So should be a good matchup tonight for the Bucs there, but with that, we're going to jump over into the Badgers. The Badgers got a win against Western Illinois, the Leathernecks. Badgers took care of business in that one. Jumping over here real quick. 71 to 49 was the finish. Uh Badgers started out kind of slow in this one. Wasn't really. I mean, they had 35 in the first in that first half, but at the same time, a lot of it was kind of ugly basketball at times. Wasn't really that great. And leading up into that second half, Badgers still defense kind of got shaky. There's a lot of defensive lapses in this one. And I mean 71-49. Badgers pulled away late. This got close. Badgers were up by a, a 15 a plus at one point in this one, and Western Illinois closed it all the way down to eight before the Badgers finally turned it back on. So kind of sketchy moments there. I got worried. I really did. I got worried. I was like, please tell me we're not going to see another upset at the Cole Center here. We cannot afford an upset here because we play uh, Marquette coming up on Saturday. We cannot afford an upset against Western Illinois leading up into that ball game. So with that, though, I'm going to jump over to Austin. He's going to run through the stats, and then we're going to dissect this game a little bit. So, Austin, what do you got for me? Starting off with the Badgers, Stephen Crowell led the way. Well, Stephen Crowell and Chucky Hepburn led, led the way. Oh, and A.J. Store. They all had 13 points there, and then Tyler Wall added a 12, 12 points for them also. Uh, Klesman only added three. Um, but I feel like that three when he that three-pointer kind of – Held the Badgers all the way. It seemed it kind of seemed like that's when they were in their little bit of a drought there when he hit that. So um kind of a big three for Klesman, but only three points. And then off the bench, um Winner and Ilver had three points. Asijan had six, and then Blackwell had five. So kind of a kind of a quiet night for Blackwell um that we've seen him at. Um and then the guys off the bench in general. But it was good to see that Crowell, Wall, uh, Storr, and Hepburn all were scoring points for them um, in double digits there. And then just taking a look at uh, the Western Illinois Leathernecks, um, like we said yesterday, James Den Jr. Um, was their main scorer, and he did put up 17 points for them there. And then um, Sissy and Myers put up eight, and then West seven, and then Lamar for them put up three. Not a whole lot coming from their bench. Three guys with two points. So same as the Badgers, they didn't really have a whole lot of bench help. Um, but together they only scored 49 points um, as a team. So not a whole lot of scoring, especially with 19 in the first quarter. Um, not good for them there. But like you were saying, uh, I was watching the game too during the second half. Or the second, yeah, the second half. And I'm like, man, how long are we going to be stuck at 39 points here? And they just kept scoring and scoring. I'm like, 
all right, well, now it's down to un, uh, single digits. Uh, what what are we going to what, – what's going on here? Um, we were finally able to get away there. Um, but I think this game is still a little bit closer than I thought we think – that we thought it was going to be. Um, 71 to 49, especially after – the Badgers put up 105 against an Arkansas State team that I think would be better than Western Illinois. I don't really know. But um, we did shoot eight for 22 three-pointers. So 36.4%. But I feel like if you're going to shoot 22 three-pointers, eight's not a whole lot when you're making them. I mean, that seems like a lot for not for only making eight. I mean, they went four for 13. So they barely shot or they barely made any three-pointers either. And then they they also had a lot more free throws than us. They went 15 for 24, and we went 13 for 16. We had a better um, we had a better percentage at the free throw line, but they shot 24 free throws. So that foul trouble and um, for the Badgers was not helping them there. But luckily, they were able to pull away in the end and make it look a lot better than it was. But I mean, if people actually watch this game, they probably got a little bit of a jump scare from this Western Illinois Leatherneck team. It definitely was ugly. And like you were saying there, the three point percentage for the Badgers, you're going to fire up 22. You got to be banging. You got to be banging something. There better be something there. And it just wasn't there from downtown. This team is so dominant in the paint. So it's like, I don't understand why are we trying to shoot so many threes when, you know, the Badgers have, look at that, uh, the uh, Fort Myers tip off there, the Badgers looked better in the paint. They scored a lot of their points in the paint, beat Virginia in the paint base. I mean, did a little bit better from downtown in that game, but it was majority in the paint. Look at that game against SMU. A lot of it came inside the paint. Now you go to this Western Illinois game where we're jacking up threes again. Nothing's falling. That is a problem. It was, like you said, good to see some of these guys actually hit threes. Connor Asesian, two threes in this one. That was good to see out of Connor. Still, though, Two for six, two for seven uh, uh, from the floor for Connor. So that's a bad, a bad night. Good to see him finally hit two, but also not so good that he's not consistent yet. That's a problem. Also, Stephen Crow. I was looking at it. They actually talked about it during it. The Badgers are plus twenty one point six points with Crow on the floor. So that's not good if you're the Badgers. If Crow gets into foul trouble, because the Badgers are a better team with Stephen Crow in there, and it's proving. In these games here, look at this one for Stephen Crowell, 13 points. He was 5 for 7 from the floor, 1 for 1 from downtown. My only problem with Stephen Crowell is that when Crowell gets it on the perimeter, he doesn't look to shoot. If you want to be a dominant big, I mean, you look back to Frank Kaminsky. Kaminsky, when he got the ball at the perimeter, he was looking to shoot. He wasn't scared to fire it up right away. And I think Crowell is a little hesitant, and that's what gets him into trouble. Even on the one he hit tonight, he that wasn't his first look. You know, you want guys, their first look to be, I'm going to shoot this basketball, then we play off the dribble, then we do whatever we got to do. I wish Stephen Crowell would do that because I think he would be a lot more dominant of a big man that can step out on the perimeter if he developed that part of his game. If he was able to step out, be able to hit the three, he can, but I think he's got to look for that shot. I don't think he always hunts that shot as a big man. I wish he would because he has a lot of opportunities out there at three-point line, but he thinks about it too much. Even when Tyler Wall, when he's attempted threes, he thinks about it too much. Carter Gilmore, they all get the ball to the perimeter and they're thinking about it. You got to have that second nature. You look at Connor Asesian, as cold as he is, two for six from downtown. Connor Asesian's first look when he gets the ball at the perimeter is, I'm going to fire it. I'm going to fire it up there. And, you know, you, sometimes you hate that, but it's a shooter's mentality. And I wish that Stephen Crowell would develop that just a little bit, just a little bit to see what it was. Blackwell. In this one, wasn't as big scoring, but I think he still had valuable minutes for the Badgers. Gave a lot of, on the defensive end, I think Blackwell brings it every night. And I think Blackwell played a pretty good game for the Badgers. Also, Connor, we talked about Connor Asesian, six points. Good to see him getting back in the scoring column there. Four Badger starters in double figures, also a good sign. Chucky got hot towards the end. That was good to see out of Chucky Hepburn. Um, Tyler Wall, another good game out of Tyler Wall. And four for five. From the floor, four for five from the line. That was huge to see as Tyler Wall hitting free throws. 
Like you talked about, there are only 16 free throws shot by the Badgers in this one. I thought that was low, especially playing a team like Western Illinois. You should be able to get a team like that into foul trouble. They got to follow you to try to prevent you to score. And the Badgers, I mean, they didn't get a lot of post touches. I thought that was a big problem. You look at it, even Stephen Crowell, 13 points against this team, only seven shots put up in this one. I don't think Crowell was able to facilitate as much even because he was catching the ball in the perimeter a lot. He wasn't getting post touches. And that... Also was the lack of aggressiveness from the Badgers. Looking at the rebound totals, I mean, we look at offensive rebounds against an even better Virginia team and an even better SMU team. The Badgers were having 20-some rebounds on the offensive end, uh, 16 rebounds on the offensive end. In this one, seven offensive rebounds, 22 rebounds uh, uh, on the defensive end, 29 in total. Only out-rebounded Western Illinois by six. That was surprising. That was really surprising. I know Western Illinois has got some length, but I still thought the Badgers aggressively should have been able to out-rebound them by a lot more, and especially in the offensive glass there. And I thought the Badgers kind of, the aggressiveness that we saw in that Fort Myers tip-off wasn't there from the Badgers in this one. So I thought that was a big thing. The Badgers need to, especially going to go up against Marquette, you got to be aggressive. They're going to have to get those second chance points, the offensive rebounds and everything like that. And I thought the Badgers lacked that in this one. Hopefully see a little bit better going forward here, especially leading up into Marquette. And then um, undisciplined defense. I thought the Badgers had a lot of undisciplined uh, undisciplined defense in this one. A lots of, I mean, a lot of jumping, not disciplined, staying on the floor, hands up, letting guys, we're running into shooters. Look at that. Uh, they had a three. He had a, he had a four-point play. Blackwell ran into him out on the three-point line. I mean, he ran through the guy. You know, undisciplined defense by the Badgers, not uh, calling screens. It looked like there was a lot of times where screens weren't being called out. There was a lot of pick and rolls the Badgers lost. I mean, there was a lot of defenders or a lot of offensive guys being lost in this one. And I thought that was a big problem for the Badgers. And we saw it against SMU. We saw it against Virginia. We didn't see it in this one. I thought it was lack of movement by the Badgers. I really noticed it again in this one was the lack of weak side movement from this offense for the Badgers. You know, you got to constantly be moving to find shots. Connor Asesian is the one guy, when he steps out on the floor, you can't knock his hustle because he's constantly moving. Connor Asesian is. But these other guys, I see a lot of standing. I see a lot of stagnant. Even if you're not involved in the play on the opposite side of the court, you can still be moving on the backside to try to open yourself up for a weak side dish or anything like that coming out of the post. And I thought the Badgers lacked that again in this one. So hopefully, leading forward, the Badgers start to address that. But, you know... A win's a win. You needed this win, and they got it. That's what matters. Now you have Marquette coming up. It's crazy to say that the easiest game in this three-game stretch coming up, Marquette, Michigan State, at Michigan State, and Arizona, your easiest game is going to be Michigan State. That's just crazy to say that your easiest game in a three-game stretch is going to be Michigan State. That is a loaded-up three-game stretch for this Badger team. Can they survive it? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, it's going to start on Saturday. It is at the Kohl Center up against Marquette. That's going to be a huge matchup. If the Badgers somehow, some way pull off that upset, it sets up for an even better road trip then because then going to Michigan State gets a lot easier. Going to Arizona gets a lot easier. You're going against a very hot Marquette team right now. You're going up against a very hot uh, Arizona team. And Michigan State's always there. They're going to get back into the rankings at some point. They're a good team. I really do think this is a troubling time for the Badgers. I do I, I do think they are going to – I I think they can win these games. I really do. I think if they play their best basketball, they can win these games. But that's going to require – they're going to have to be a lot better from the perimeter. They're going to have to hit these shots. 8 for 22 is not going to cut it against Marquette. You're going to have to bang some of these threes. The three-point line could be crucial in that one. And – Player fouls, 15 in this one. Badgers going to have to get some of these other teams in foul trouble. You're going to have to outshoot them at the line. They're going to have to get the free throw line and make it count, and they're going to have to avoid getting into a running game with Marquette. Marquette's too fast for them. They're going to have to avoid getting into a running game. So with that, though, anything I missed in that Western Illinois game? Is there anything I really missed in there? Not the Western Illinois game, um, but I just want to point out the opportunity that the Badgers have here. They're playing number three, Marquette, like you said, Michigan State, they're not ranked right now, but they probably will be. And then number two, Arizona. And then they play number one, Purdue, twice. That I mean, first off, you beat number one, Purdue, at least one of those times, boost your resume, 
and you be either Marquette or Arizona, that's huge on your resume. I mean, the Badgers have a huge opportunity here to boost their resume early in the season and then um, do a, do a good amount of damage in the Big Ten in uh, conference play to set them up for a good seeding in the March Madness tournament. I mean, it's super early, but these early games matter. And, um, I mean, we saw what – we saw what Marquette was able to do and Purdue was the, what Purdue was able to do in the Maui tournament. So um, even though the Badgers weren't in like a big tournament this year, they were in the Fort Myers tip off. They didn't have the greatest of uh, competition that some of these other teams did. They still are playing these other really good teams. So it's a good opportunity for the Badgers to hopefully uh, steal a win from one of these teams and uh, boost their resume as this, and then see, see how they do as the season goes on. You can afford – I think you can afford to lose both of them. I think you can. I really do. I think you're going to lose – you can afford You can afford to lose to Marquette. You can afford to lose to Arizona. What you can't do is afford to go on an 0-3 stretch right now. You have to win one of these games, whether it's at home against Marquette, whether it's – that's a big resume booster. On the road at Arizona is huge. And on the road at Michigan State will be big because I know Michigan State's going to play themselves back into a ranking of some sort. But best case scenario, I really do think Badgers win two out of three. I really do. If they win three out of three, I hats off. Hats off. They played a one dominant stretch of basketball. But it's difficult to do something like that. You look at, I mean, I mean, look at Marquette. They went through the gauntlet. They had to play Tennessee. Um Kansas, and then Purdue in that Maui uh, tip-off or that Maui tournament there. That's a loaded up stretch there. And now, you know, the Badgers facing the same kind of, not really the same monster, but, it's, you know, same token. I think you can afford to lose one, maybe two, but you can't afford to get swept here. You can't afford three losses in a row. You got to pick one of these teams apart and beat this one. Saturday, sold out crowd at the Cole Center. That's going to be a huge opportunity for the Badgers. Down in Tucson, that's going to be tough. That's going to be a, I, I don't, I think it's a Friday night game in Tucson, but Badger fans travel, but it's still going to be majority Arizona. You beat Marquette, that could be a ranked matchup now in Arizona. So this is going to be a huge test, like you were talking, for the Badgers there to really show something to us here over the next week. So hopefully, Good things out of the Wisconsin Badgers moving forward here. But with that, we're going to, before we jump into the Badger football, we're going to jump over to Austin with our fact of the day. Uh, on this day in 1895, America's first auto race organized by the Chicago Times Herald was a race um, from Chicago to Evanston and then back to Chicago. Uh, had six cars, 55 miles, and some guy named Frank Dorea won it by an average of seven miles per hour. Can you imagine that race? Seven miles per hour. And now you look at NASCAR and they're going almost 200, they're going over 200 miles an hour. So it's crazy how far we've gone from the first race to now all these NASCAR races. It's like we're watching golf and NASCAR put together. Seven miles per hour is crazy. Seven miles per hour. It's like watching golf and NASCAR put together. Two really slow sports put together. NASCAR, golf. NASCAR and golf. Seven miles per hour. So with that, though, let's jump over to the Badgers. Austin, we've been talking about bowl games. Badgers awaiting their bowl game. What are some of the predictions right now that they're showing for the Badgers there, kind of matchup-wise, who they could be facing here? Yeah, just looking at a couple different things. A lot of what I'm seeing is uh, the Music City Bowl in Nashville. Um, A lot of people all over the um, sports media saying Music City Bowl. Um, A lot of guys, a lot of people are saying possibly Texas A&M. 
Um, and then also possibly Auburn, and then one person said Kentucky. Um, and then another another um, place they might land is uh, possibly the Pinstripe Bowl, which the Badgers have been to once already. And, I mean, <laughs> I don't really know if the Badgers want to be playing in another uh, MLB stadium there. And then another one I saw was the Reliquest Bowl in Tampa, Florida, um, which was formerly the Outback Bowl. Um, it's usually the – the runner up in the Big Ten championship usually heads there, I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm guessing Iowa, if they're probably gonna lose in Michigan, I'm guessing Iowa's probably gonna get that game, the Outback Bowl there. But um this guy from ESPN said that there's a chance that they get into the real quest uh bowl. And um not really sure who it says that they would play or who they think it'd play, but what I'm getting at is probably some type of music like not a New Year's Six Bowl, obviously, and probably a little bit less than um, kind of like the the New Year's Eve games there. But uh, um looks like Texas A&M or possibly Auburn is what they're looking at there. But I also don't – I think – oh, no, this was, this was yesterday that they posted this. So I thought at Auburn losing to Alabama, um, they might have lost their bowl eligibility there. But I'm not – I guess maybe not – I'm not a fan of playing Auburn. I'm not. I Especially don't like that matchup. Game. I don't like that matchup for Wisconsin. I don't know if I even like Texas A&M. I don't think I like either one of those matchups for Wisconsin if I'm hoping for a bowl win. This Wisconsin team this season, I don't like it. I really don't. Right now, we don't know with Braylon Allen. He is up on the air. He's up in the air right now if he's going to – Return to Madison from what I saw. Uh, let's see if I can't find it. Basically, he came out and just talked about um, not sure on his decision, but we'll know soon enough. Kind of worries me. With an injury-prone guy and in leading up into the NFL draft, that kind of thing, He, you know, a lot of guys don't play in this kind of the bowl games and stuff like that. They want to start to prepare themselves. So, Kind of worried Braylon Allen might not be out there for this one, if he, especially if he's going to move on. And if he doesn't play in this one without Jackson Aker, Badgers running backs get kind of slim. And I don't like that combo. Katie Akamele is an okay running back, but without somebody in front of him, without somebody to tandem up with him, I'm not a fan of the Badgers there in that run department. So that could get ugly. Also, I just want to touch on a little bit. Do we think. The Badgers offense is okay with Phil Longo leading this, leading the charge. And I look at statistics because that's the way people love to look at things is with statistics. I mean, if we want to look at how good Jordan Love is doing in his first year with the Badger or with the Packers, we look at his stats compared to Aaron Rodgers' stats. I think it's the stupidest thing ever, but people do it because that's what they love to do. They love to compare stats. So with that, I want to look at the stats. So under Phil Longo, 2023 Badgers averaging 22 points per game right now, 33 touchdowns, 238 first downs on the season here. Their first downs, uh, third down efficiency right now, 82 out of 184. They're about 44% on third down, 27% on fourth down. Okay. Let's look back. We'll just say to last year, the year that everything was a mess, 44 total touchdowns last year, 26 total points per game. Uh, 233 first downs there. They were 68 for 169 on third down. So they were averaging about 40%. So a little bit worse on third down uh, percentage. Fourth down percentage, 46%. They're about, I think they were about equal there on fourth down. Better on fourth down, actually. Way better on fourth down. So looking at those two, Badgers offense got a little bit worse year by year. Scoring touchdowns, they were fine. Flip side of it, offensive efficiency, not so well. Looking back to 2021, offense was still struggling on third downs there, fourth down percentage, 55%, but 40 touchdowns, 25 points per game. So their points per game have gone down. Their efficiency on third down, on fourth down, on fourth down has gotten worse, on third down has gotten better. So if we look at the two compared to each other, why is that? Why are we looking at such a difference there? The passing game. It simply is going from passing game right now. The passing game for the Badgers has, I mean, 
with the additions of all these guys in the transfer portal, also bringing in Tanner Mordecai and Braden Locke, guys who can actually sling the ball around. The offense is oriented around the pass game. We're averaging a little bit better on third down. We're not so prone on running the football. So right now, but those are the stats. So let's dial back. And let's look at what we're what we're thinking right now. This Badger team offensively looks out of sorts. And to me, I just don't believe Phil Longo is the right guy for the job. When I look at North Carolina, Phil Longo is there. North Carolina kind of came back to relevancy in the football world. Phil Longo leaves. North Carolina is still relevant into the football world. Their offense wasn't terrible this year. They definitely were great, but they weren't terrible. So to me, that doesn't mean that Phil Longo is the greatest offensive coordinator in the world. And when I look at him with the Badgers now, we see a lot of lack of usage of Braylon Allen at times. You know, you have one of the better running backs in college football. We can say that arguably Braylon Allen is going into this season. He was on many watch lists and he dropped off. We stopped using him as much. He doesn't get him involved in the pass game. Looking at the schemes that Wisconsin's running on the offensive side, not playing to Tanner Mordecai's strengths, a lot of his strengths is getting the ball out quickly. Badger's trying to air it out too much. So when I look at Phil Longo, I don't think he schemes well. I don't care if you don't have your recruits in there. I don't think he schemes well for what the Badgers have in the room. So if next year his recruits still aren't what he wants, then what does he do? What do we do then with this Badgers offense? Because if you're statistically getting worse, you know, you're not scoring as much. Your offense is getting worse scoring the football. We can't put the ball in the end zone. And when we get to the red zone, we turn it over. We don't come, We don't uh, put the ball in the end zone. What do you do? And you can't blame it all on Luke Fickle because he's not calling the offense. That's on Phil Longo. So I am leaning towards that. I don't trust Phil Longo right now to lead this offense. You have to give him another year. It's his first year. We got to give him another year, but going into next year, I think that's the true test. I think next year with this Badger team, he's going to lose Tanner Mordecai. You don't know what's going to happen in the transfer portal, but you can imagine they're going to draw guys into Madison. They're going to draw in their guys. Apparently, they didn't draw them in this year. They're going to draw them in next year. I don't know how they really think it's going to change, but whatever. So in your opinion, what are you seeing out of the Badgers offense this year, and how do you see them stacking up? Because right now, to me, I mean, you look at the stats – Even in just the Big Ten for the Badgers, the Badgers are sitting, I think, near the bottom. Offensively, they're sitting middle of the pack. They're sitting middle of the pack right now offensively in the Big Ten. Defensively, have sitting middle of the pack, so they're a middle of the pack team. But they're getting, I mean, their offense is ranked worse than the offense that they beat in Purdue, the offense that they beat in Illinois, Maryland's offense. They're worse than those three offenses. I could see you being worse than Michigan. I could see you being worse than Penn State and Ohio State, but you shellacked Purdue, and your offense is ranked worse than what Purdue is. So what are you seeing out of Phil Longo in the Wisconsin's offense, and do you feel comfortable with him moving forward here as Wisconsin's offensive coordinator? Yeah, I feel like they're a little bit discombobulated sometimes. You know, I feel like sometimes they're not calling the right plays, but that happens to every coach sometimes. You're just not calling the right plays. But like you said, they're not, I feel like they're not utilizing their players that they have. I mean, they got a lot of talent on this Wisconsin team. They brought in some guys, whatever you want to say. They got Braylon Allen. I mean, it didn't help that Braylon Allen also got hurt, but sometimes it's just they're not playing to their strengths. And it could be something new that us Wisconsin fans are. I mean, we're used to the run game and we're used to them dominating that. We're used to them throwing to tight ends, using fullbacks more, all this bunch of stuff. And they're not they're not doing that. They're they're throwing the ball to wide receivers a lot more. And not saying Wisconsin didn't throw to uh, wide receivers uh, before, but you know it's the air raid offense. That's what they're calling. It. And I mean they're not they're not raiding no air. I'm telling you that much right now. I mean um, when Phil Longo came in, we were like, oh, we're gonna be start throwing the ball more. I feel like some people got a little excited there. They're like, oh, they're gonna we're throwing the ball more. Blah blah blah. Well, I mean. The run was working just fine when Paul Chris was here, whatever you want to say. So, um, especially now that you read those stats, I mean, we had more touchdowns. Our fourth down was better, which uh, it helps a little bit that you're full. Obviously, when you want to go for fourth down, you want to have a better conversion rate there. But you had more touchdowns by 10, and uh, 
now that that decreased um third third down percentage stayed the same but um when you brought in this this supposedly really good offensive coordinator here that brought North Carolina back from the from the depths of whatever and then now he's on our team not doing so hot and North Carolina's doing just fine um it, it, it makes you question some things a little bit. Like you said, he's he's going to obviously – this isn't obviously be his only one year. He's going to come back for another year. Um, so, I mean, next year will definitely tell a lot on um, if Phil Longo is going to stay with the Badgers or not, uh, especially now it will be another year of them getting their, their own recruits, for se. Um, so, yeah, it will be def- definitely interesting on – to see what happens. It'll be interesting to see what happens in this bowl game if they do end up playing an SEC team here and then you go up against a um, an SEC caliber team in Texas A&M or Auburn, especially if they get Auburn to see how they play against them after Auburn just almost beat Alabama. Um, that'd be interesting to see. But that's that's kind of what my – that's kind of, kind of what my thoughts are at right now. You know, and it just it just kind of baffles me because when he came into town, we were going to, like you said, we were told we're getting this air raid, high octane, we're going to try to outscore opponents kind of offense. Looking at the stats from this season, I mean, the Badgers points per game right now, 22.83 points per game. They're outscoring their opponent. Their opponents are averaging about 18.92 points per game right now. First downs, 106 of them rushing. 119 uh, through the air, but you look at yards gained on the ground, 2,149 through the run game for the Badgers. Looking at their pass game right now, I mean, attempts, completions, they're averaging about four, 429 attempts to about 254 completions right now. So not very high. They're averaging about 2,483 yards through the air it's not really a high octane passing offense. So everybody who wanted this big change for Wisconsin, did you really get it? I mean, did you honestly really get the big change? Because these are Paul Chris recruits. So why are we trying? If if the offense looks like crap, it's because we're trying to change stuff. If it's still Paul Chris recruits, what were Paul Chris recruits brought to town for the run offense? We're going to run. We're going to play play action. We're going to do that kind of stuff against you. Why, why did we try to change that so fast? Why didn't we try to implement slowly into the air raid offense, but also work with Paul Chris old offense with the ground and pound with putting that full back in there in the backfield. I mean, with running the play action a lot there, quick hitters, that kind of thing for this Badger team, looking at them, 11 touchdowns through the air. 21 touchdowns on the ground for the Badgers on the season so far. Where is the difference there? I mean, the rush game is still where it's at with Wisconsin. So did we really see any change? I don't think so. I really don't think we saw a change with Wisconsin's offense from what Paul Chris was trying to do with what Jim Leonard finished up doing. And then leading up into what Phil Longo is doing, he had to rely back on the run game because the pass game wasn't there. And I think it just, it's fitting. It really is. For everybody who told me Paul Christ wasn't it and the Badgers couldn't win with the run game, and yet how many games have we said this year the Badgers had to rely on old reliable, the run game in that one? Look at the game against Minnesota. Without Braylon Allen in the run game, Badgers don't win it. Plain and simple. Leading into this one, I mean, you get into whatever bowl game it is, I guarantee you the Badgers have better run game than they do pass game in that one. So I just it just baffles me right now looking at this Badger team looking at what the change was supposed to be and not seeing the change. I think that was a big thing. We were supposed to see a big change in culture and everything like that, and I did not see it this season. Maybe going into the next season, I mean, we're going to get more into this on the season recap, but uh, maybe going into the next season we see a little bit more change. As of right now, not seeing it. Not seeing the change. I think we're still on old reliable. We got to rely back on the run, and I think that's where we're at right now with this Badger team. So with that, we're going to jump over. College football weekend, uh, pulling up the old scoreboard here from this last weekend. We had, oh, if I can get her to come up here, we had a big rivalry weekend there. Ole Miss beating Mississippi State 17-7. to Oregon got the win over Oregon State 31-7. to Texas with the win over Texas Tech 57-7. to 
did see Arch Manning in that one. Cool to see Arch Manning finally getting some playing time. Uh, number nine, Missouri over Arkansas, 48 to 14. Penn State got the win over Michigan State, 42 to nothing. Oklahoma over TCU, 69 to 45. Iowa got the win over Nebraska, 13 to 10. Tulane, 29 to 16 over UTSA. Georgia, 31 to 23 over Georgia Tech. Michigan pulls it off in Ann Arbor. Uh, 30 to 24 over Ohio State. Just a fitting end to Ohio State season right there. Washington, number four, Washington got the win over Washington State. A nail biter, 24 to 21. Florida State got a gutsy win over Florida, 24 to 15. Alabama pulled off a stunner late against Auburn. 27 to 24 was the finish. Louisville. We were high on Louisville. They lost it for us. 38 31. They lose. That'll be it for their college ball playoff hopes. LSU got the big win over Texas AM, 42 to 30. Arizona, three losses on the season. Arizona, they look good. 59 23 over Arizona State. Notre Dame got the win over Stanford, 56 to 23. Iowa State pulls off the upset over Kansas State, 42 to 35. Oklahoma State over BYU in two overtimes. It took to finish that one, 40 to 34. Texas A&M, or Tennessee over Vanderbilt. Don't know why I said Texas A&M. They're a rough one for me. 48 to 24 there. Ten, uh, NC State took care of North Carolina, 39 to 20. Clemson got the win over South Carolina, 16 to 7. And Liberty gets the win over UTEP, 42 to 28. So which games stood out most to you over the weekend there? I think I first got to talk about the Alabama Auburn game. Um, even though Alabama did get the win over Auburn, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people saw the ending of that game. And if you didn't, uh, go watch it because it was like a fourth and goal, and they were on like the 30 or 35, 40 yard line going in. It was it was a fourth and goal, but it was they had a long ways to go, and they pretty much just threw up a hail mary, and they somehow came down with it against an Auburn team who's three and five in the SEC and six and six overall. So not very good. And if Alabama would have lost that game, um, they might have been still in the uh, SEC conference championship, but not entirely sure there. It, it definitely would have been hurtful f- towards their uh, playoff football um, chances there. Also, um, looking at some of the games, um, Iowa State versus Kansas State, um, one of their rushers, Sama the third, 16 carries, 276 yards, and three touchdowns in the snow. I mean, that sounds like some fun football to me. Um, big win for Iowa State. They go seven and five, end off the year, end off the year seven and five, beat a pretty decent Kansas State team, and uh get a huge road win there for them. Um, I picked North Carolina to win against NC State and um, they did not. That was tough to see there. Uh, close game, Clemson, South Carolina. But Clemson got away with the win there. Um, Clemson's kind of made it out the rough a little bit. They started off they started off very slow in the beginning of the year, and uh, now they'll probably be ranked maybe a little bit higher, um, get a decent bowl game for them there. And then, obviously, the Kentucky-Louisville game. Louisville um, – had their chance, had their chances. I'm pretty sure it was it was pretty close, obviously, throughout the whole game. Um, but ended up giving up giving up a late touchdown there to Kentucky. And like you said, um kind of threw away their college football playoff chances and hopes there. I'm pretty sure they're still in the they're still in the conference championship game, which is the holidays on Dale's gonna be played against Florida State there, who uh has their backup quarterback and they played a pretty tough game against a Florida team who um, Graham Mertz did not play for Florida there. They had their backup also in. But um, these rivalry games, as you can see by all these scores, I mean, rivalry games are tough. Uh, they're going to be one-score games no matter what the record is of either team. Um, it's always a chance to get one last um, one last ha, like as you can say, against another team. Ruin their chances if your team's not doing so good. You can ruin your your rivals team on chances that they have, and that's kind of what I think Kentucky did there. They kind of ruined Louisville's chance at some things, even though uh, Kentucky seven and five and three and two in conference. I mean, they're they're looking to play um, possibly against Wisconsin, like we said earlier. Um, 
like Washington, Washington State, Washington, that was a close game also, 24 to 21 uh, there. And uh, Washington State, they started off hot. They were ranked at one point when they played the Badgers, and now they're five and seven. I don't even know if they're going to make a bowl game there. Um, but Washington keeps their playoff hopes alive as well. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they play Oregon. So that's going to be a very interesting conference championship game uh, between those two. The winner pretty much going to the college football playoffs, I have to say. Um, same with the Georgia Alabama game, uh, conference game. I'm pretty sure the winner of that one might is. Well, winner for sure is going to make it to the college football playoffs, but if Georgia loses, um, I don't know. If it's it's tough. It is tough. I could see them both getting in. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the Michigan, the Michigan versus Ohio State game. That was a very good game. Um, obviously a classic by those two. Number three, number two, and Michigan um, pulls out the win there. Uh, with a last second interception as Ohio State was driving down to score their touchdown. Probably that would have taken the lead because they would have made their extra points. So um, Michigan's in the conference championship against Iowa. Um, Iowa represent, representing the Big Ten West there. I mean, barely beat Nebraska. A last that second field goal in there. And the fans go crazy. Um, uh, it won't be a Iowa, game in the Big Ten championship. That is going to be yeah. ugly. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be ugly. I mean, honestly, no matter what team would have made it out of the Big Ten West, it was gonna be ugly against any team in the Big Ten East. Uh, honestly, but um, just seeing Iowa there makes me sick because um, I don't like Iowa and how they're ranked seventeen. I have no idea because they have barely been winning these games. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, Tulane or not Tulane? Yeah, Tulane getting their win against UTSA. Um, love the Mean Green Wave there. Um, probably going to see them in the Cotton Bowl or some type of big New Year's Six Bowl as long as they win their conference championship. Probably again, I don't know who they play exactly. Probably the loser of Washington, Oregon, um, I'd assume, because that's usually how it kind of works there. But um, And then I also did see um, JMU Dukes are bowl eligible. They they are in a bowl game after their whole NCAA um or NCAA thing going from FCS to FBS. They had to sit out two years of bowl eligibility. But because not enough teams made it um, for bowl games, they were they were able to uh, sneak in and get a bowl game. So that's I'm, I'm happy to see that for them as they had a really good year. And uh, I, I still don't know if they're able to make uh, play in their conference championship, what kind of sucks for them. But at least they get a bowl game and they'll be able to finish off their year on a – possible trophy there for them so just a little bit of my thoughts on all these games obviously one of the best weeks of football is always rivalry week and uh uh, once again this kind of showed that so i just hope the badgers don't get james madison because i don't want to lose to james madison that's that would be actually an insane game that would barely sneak into the playoffs they barely get into the playoffs and they beat the badgers that would just be a fitting way to end the badger season right there but You mentioned a game. The biggest loser of Michigan and Ohio State. Was the biggest loser in that one Ryan Day or Jim Harbaugh for not being on the sideline? I think Ryan Day. You've lost three in a row to Michigan. And for Jim Harbaugh, you didn't even have to be on the sideline for your guys to beat Ohio State. I think Jim Harbaugh, it's a big win for him and Michigan to do it without him. Now you get him back for the Big Ten Championship. I think that's huge. I think Ryan Day is on the hot seat for Ohio State. He's got a good record, but but we know it's true. If you can't beat the best, they find somebody else who can. And I think Ohio State might move on from Ryan Day here pretty soon because he cannot get past Michigan. Yeah. Um, I think – it was kind of the same situation with Jim Harbaugh a few years ago. He uh, wasn't able to beat Ohio State for the longest time, finally got over the hump three years ago, and now he's on a three-game win streak against Ohio State. Even though he wasn't on the sideline, like you said, he still practices or he still coaches the team throughout the week. He's just not able to be on the sideline during the games, which is he's kind of – He's on a phone call. Somebody's yeah, calling him on the phone. <laughs> definitely still spying on things, but uh, – no, I'm kidding. But um, I'm pretty sure he'll be able to be – I don't know if he'll be able to be at the game uh, for the conference championship and the playoffs. I'm not yep. I'm entirely sure. I'm he pretty sure only, he is. He only, 
He only had it was only regular season. season. The regular season. Yeah. yeah. So he is so back uh, that's huge for Michigan that they were able to pull off that win. Um, but like you said, yeah, definitely worse for Ryan Day. Uh, he's definitely on the hot seat, and I would not be surprised if Ohio State starts looking for a new coach. Even though, I mean, Ryan Day's what he's a lot of wins and only three losses, a few losses, and those came against Michigan and and then in the playoff in the playoffs. So. It's crazy, but that's how college football works, especially when you're losing to your rival, especially in the game, Ohio State, Michigan. Uh, that means everything to these these universities. So if you can't get the job done, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna be out of there just as fast as you came in. Definitely is definitely the truth right there. And with that, that is about all we got for college football for today. We're gonna jump over into college basketball, men's college basketball. Coming up tonight, the ACC SEC Challenge is starting on ESPN 630. A pretty good game is going to be taking place. Number eight, Miami taking on number 12, Kentucky. Let's just do some prediction through here. I'm going to take Kentucky to win that game against Miami at the Rupp. I like Kentucky, yeah. They've always been a pretty good, solid team there. Um, Miami's kind of – they've also been doing pretty good too. Miami's number eight, Kentucky 12. But is it is in Lexington, so I'm gonna go with Kentucky. And then eight o'clock FS1. Wisconsin fans are well. You're not a Badger fan. You're a Marquette fan. Marquette will be taking on Southern. They're gonna have it's gonna be an eight o'clock tip there on FS1 from the Pfizer. We're gonna jump over quick, just looking at the rest of the week in college basketball. Quick on Wednesday. Uh, 615 tip, ten, number 10, Tennessee, taking on number 17, North Carolina. That should be a pretty good matchup. It's in Chapel Hill. I'm going to take North Carolina to win that game over Tennessee. I'm going to take Tennessee just because, uh, I mean, we saw firsthand how Tennessee plays, and uh, they have a lot of good talent on their team. I think Tennessee is going to pull away with the win uh, on the road. Another, it's not a ranked matchup, but ACC SEC challenge. Texas A and M number fourteen. Texas A and M taking on Virginia. I think I like Virginia on that one. I really do. I think Virginia bounces back there uh, in Virginia against Texas A and M. I like Texas A and M, especially after seeing Virginia how they struggled to score against the Badgers. Um, I like Virginia, or I like Texas A and M, not Virginia. Next up on Wednesday, 8-15 start, ESPN, number seven, Duke, taking on Arkansas. I'm going to be honest, I like Arkansas pulling off the upset here. Arkansas, four and three record, not a great record to look at, but this Arkansas team is pretty well put together. They have a pretty good team. I'm going to take Arkansas to pull the upset at home. Yeah, Arkansas, they were, I'm pretty sure they were ranked not too long ago, if I can't, if I can remember, but, um, I mean, it's Duke, Duke basketball. Um, I don't think they're going to have – I mean, it, it could be a close game, but I think Duke's going to win this one. There we go. He's taking Duke. We do not like him anymore. I don't hey, like Duke. Duke. I don't want to take Duke, but I have to take Duke. He's taking Duke. He's taking Duke. That's enough said right there. <laughs> With that, though, that is about all we have for you guys today. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys back here tomorrow. But until then – This has been Wisconsin Sports on the go with trades. Thank you guys for listening. Deuces.